Cool guys, so I, I'm gonna talk to you about pitch decks, right? So the first thing I wanna talk about is the components in an investor meeting, right? So Matt from Loke touched on it already and he did a phenomenal job of it. And the first bit is there has to be a discussion. When you're having an investor meeting, the first thing you have to understand is it has to be a discussion. See, the paradigm a lot of people come from is that, okay, I'm going there, I'm telling them about my business, right? I'm just gonna tell them about my business, I'm gonna pitch them, I'm going to go through my deck, and I'm going to ask them for money, essentially, right? But the, at the end of the day, what you have to understand is that an investor relationship has to be mutually beneficial, right? Like, you have to get value out of it, because you're getting their money to scale your business or create your product, but also they have to get value out of it because they're investing in you and they want to have a return on their money, right? So for it to be a mutually beneficial relationship, what you have to understand is when you walk in, it should be two-way dialogue. So Matt hit the nail on the head. He said, ask them questions, and that's how it should be done. You need to ask questions. You need to vet them as well because you have to come from the, the frame, essentially, that you're not the one only pitching. Right? You can flip the script, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later when we go to social dynamics, when we go to neuroscience. Right? The first thing you have to understand is this idea of a discussion has to be included. The second thing is, ideally, every presentation is going to have a, a demo. Right? You're gonna show them what you've actually built, you're gonna show them um, what you have, and they're gonna buy into that in terms of whether they believe it's a good thing or not. Right? And the third component is you're going to have the pitch deck. Right? So Joel's kind of touched on it, Matt's kind of touched on it, but we're just gonna deconstruct that a little bit further. The re reality with the pitch deck though is, okay, in terms of the weighting of importance of those three criteria, um, sorry, those three components, yes, the discussion's hugely beneficial, right? Yes, the demo is hugely beneficial because at the end of the day, that's what they're gonna be investing in. The discussion is your team, the demo is your product. So ultimately, that's what they're investing in. But here's the thing, you're not gonna to get to the stage of being able to show those, uh, show those things to an investor if you haven't caught their attention with your pitch deck, right? So this is essentially like the gatekeeper. This is what gets you through the door to get to the other two stages that then you have to hit, right? First thing I wanna start off with the pitch deck is a reality check, okay? So let's walk through a scenario when, when you're trying to send somebody um, a pitch deck and when they're gonna read the pitch deck, right? Investors are very, very busy people. Joel talked about it before. They get tons and tons and tons of deal flow through, right? So you're, you're gonna be one of the crowd. They're not gonna have a lot of time for you. Like, you're caught in your own reality if you think they're gonna sit down and they're gonna go through every single like, link in your pitch deck. Like, to, to think that they're gonna read through every single slide in, in utmost detail and do due diligence on every single pitch deck that gets sent to them, right? Like, it's just unrealistic. So what you have to think about is, okay, put myself in the shoes of an investor. What's the time frame? What's the circumstance when they're actually gonna read it? Largely, it's gonna be in between meetings. They're gonna have a like, cursory look and open up your pitch deck, right? You'll send it to them before your investor meeting. They'll see the attachment. A lot of investors actually say they don't even read through the whole email. They'll open the pitch deck, have a flick through, right? So what you have to understand is, people who have been to one of our masterclasses before is, we really like neuroscience, and we think about how the brain works. There's a part of your brain called the limbic system. This is the part of your brain responsible for attention. The limbic system has seven seconds. Seven seconds to decide whether they're gonna let that information go to the part of the brain responsible for thinking. It makes sense if, the, if your information, your deck, doesn't go to the part of the brain responsible for thinking, you're done anyway, right? It doesn't matter how like, fancy everything else is later on. If you've already been cut off by the gatekeeper, which is the limbic system, it's like the bouncer at, at the club, you're not getting through, right? So now we have to deconstruct how do we get through that bouncer, right? So what you have to do is you have to make it emotional. Okay, there's this big thing, um, it's, it's an adage in, in sales terminology, and it's, it's just people buy from people, right? So you think about, okay, you send them a pitch deck, they open it up, seven seconds, they have to decide whether they like it or not, and we've kind of been through what's gonna be in a pitch deck um, in terms of a problem, in terms of your solution, and we'll go through that in a little bit more detail later. What you have to know is that you have to be emotional from the start. Emotional doesn't necessarily mean just tug at their heartstrings and put in like a tear joker in the opening slide, right? <laughs> Not necessarily, it could work. There's three criteria for your limbic system to acknowledge information. It's if it thinks it wants to mate with it. If it... It's true. Thank you. There we go. I didn't even plan her either. I, if it wants to mate with it, if it's scared of it, or if it's novel, 
right? If it's never seen it before. You can, you can, realistically, you can use any of those three criteria when you're making a pitch deck, but that's what you have to know. Like biologically speaking, that's how our brain works, right? So here's the thing. They open up your pitch deck, opening slide, right? You have seven seconds. And this is where we really like to simplify things. People think, okay, we have to have, um, we have to have revenue projections, we have to have, um, we have to have like a problem, a solution, like our product, our team. And they, they think about all these things in a disconnected way. Which brings me to the next slide. What you have to think about when creating your pitch deck is you're not necessarily just giving a presentation, right? Because for me, a presentation is connotative of, like, to be short, a boring, disconnected, um, like, collection of slides, right? Like, all these things, like, okay, you can have your problem, you can have your solution, you can have, like, revenue projections, but there's no real, like, congruence through the whole thing. There's no consistency. So what you see is like each of these slides can stand alone, like in a presentation, right? Each of these slides can stand alone. They can be independent. Here's the problem with having independent slides. When somebody looks at one slide as a standalone, for instance, they're not compelled, they have no incentive to keep reading on. And that's a, that's a big problem because when you're creating your pitch deck, you have say 10 to 15 slides, right? You have like a reasonably succinct number of slides. You need them to read through each of those slides. Like, they can't stand alone because if they stand alone, you, you risk them only reading a couple of those slides. They only read a couple of the slides, they don't see your total value proposition and they don't see the team you're trying to promote. Like, they don't see um, the market opportunity, right? You run the risk of them not reading through the whole thing. So what you have to have confidence in is, okay, now, when I know what I have to include in my pitch deck in terms of like the anatomy, like the 12 slides you have to put on it, right? Like those are pretty stock standard and they're across all of them. I have a slide about that in a, like, a little bit and I'll show you and that's fine. Like that's, that's not the sexy stuff. When you know that stuff is, is really solid, when you know that stuff is very valuable for them to know, right? Like if they know those things, then we're like increase our probability to get an investment. Then your objective is to get them through those 12 slides, that's it. Right? And what we like to do is like, we really like to strip back the objectives. And like one of the things from like, um, just like a psychological point of view, when, when you give somebody a huge, really big task, like they're scared of it. They're like, oh, that's not possible. Um, they're really hesitant. Like they become anxious about like this huge task. So when you, when you try to like overcomplicate um, an investment pitch and be like, oh, you have to raise like a million dollars or $500,000 or tell them about all X, Y, Z about my business. Like that's a hugely daunting task. So what we say is like, okay, let's simplify it. So how you simplify it is, okay, at the end of each slide, you have one objective, just one. At the end of each slide, what you want them to do is turn to the next slide. Right? Like if we replicate that objective across each of the slides, at the end of each slide, you turn to the next slide. What you have then is at the start, they'll turn to the second one, second one to the third one, third to the fourth, and eventually, like if you give them enough of a compelling incentive, they'll get through the entire deck. They won't even think about, oh, I, I've had to read 12 slides. They're like, oh, I wanted to read the next slide. Oh, I wanted to read the next slide. What happened? Bang, it's done, right? So why we tie it back to a story versus a presentation is because a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. A story, a story is compelling. A story captures, like, I don't want to say captures imagination because like that's really cliche, but like a, a story is like laced with like these emotional um, components, right? And we talked about it before, what engages the limbic system? Emotion. So when you're able to demonstrate like your pitch or your company in a story, you're able to tell them, okay, this is why we've come up with it. This is the beginning, right? You pique their curiosity. This is why you want to find out about the middle. They're like, oh, wow, this is a problem I can identify with. I want to find out like, how they're solving it, who's trying to solve it, right? They flick through, they get to the middle. Like, if it's a really good story, like if it's a really good movie, for instance, you're never just gonna turn it off in the middle. You wanna find out how it ends. So you make it a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. You get them all the way through, and you have confidence that if you hit the right material, you're going to um, portray the right image for your company, and you're gonna get the objective, or at least put yourself in the best position to get the objective you want. So here's a big thing. This is the last slide after the pitch, before the pitch anatomy, right? It's a very simple equation and it says, when you combine logic and emotion, you get commitment, right? So it's a big thing in sales, a big thing in persuasion, a big thing in influence. Um, when you want 
somebody to, to behave in a certain way, you have to combine these two components, right? And this is somewhat reductive, I know, like there's only two components, logic and emotion equals commitment, but here's why. Here's why we are on the side of having to combine both, right? Because, okay, say this is an extreme example, but you have a pitch that is purely logical, like 100% logic, no emotion in it, right? Like just numbers, facts, this is why it works, like this is the market opportunity, this is how we can deliver on it. What you'll find is like on paper, your investor will understand, like it's, it, you logically step them through it, they'll understand this opportunity makes sense. Like this is a, like a smart investment decision, we shouldn't put money in this if we want to make more money, right? Like on paper, they'll understand. But something in their gut won't allow them to pull the trigger, right? Because it's purely uh, logic-based. Let's take a flip on the other side. And let's say you, you pitch your, your company with only emotion, like 100% emotion, no logic there, right? You just create this hugely compelling narrative that gets people and that draws people and you're such a good storyteller that they're like, oh my gosh, like I can, like that totally resonates with me. I can totally see why this person X is experiencing this problem. I can totally see why like, like if I deliver this solution, like I will be able to solve, um, if, I'll be able to solve a huge problem and provide huge societal value, right? Like if you go all emotion, what you'll find is like generally they'll buy into it at, at, at the time and they'll be like, they'll be compelled to make a decision and be like, hey, that, that makes sense. Like it's kind of tugging at my heartstrings, like metaphorically, potentially, literally. And I'll be like, okay, like let's do this. Here's the problem. The emotional state is spiked by one thing and that was your pitch. What happens is you leave the room and you're no longer there. So the trigger to their emotional state is now gone. What happens when they're no longer emotional? They're logical and rational. Right? Anybody with a partner can kind of attest to that. <laughs> right? <laughs> when you're not emotional, you're logical. And if you didn't have any logic in your presentation, what happens? They can't justify why they should make that investment decision. So they back out, they get cold feet, and they don't follow through. So what you have to do is you have to find the correct balance between logic and emotion. I can't sit here and say like 30%, 40 uh, that adds up to 70, 30%, 70%. <laughs> I was gonna add another 30, but yeah. 30%, 70%, I can't tell you like actual numbers, what you're gonna have to balance. What I can tell you is these are one, definitely going to differ based on your actual investor, but also they're gonna differ in terms of your stage, right? Your angel investors are gonna be, generally speaking, different to VCs, because VCs are a lot more cut and dry in terms of, okay, we need to make money here. Like we have, um, we have people to answer to. Like it's not necessarily our money. We have people to answer to. We have to meet certain KPIs. We have to meet certain deadlines. So they're gonna be a lot more logical, right? To an extent, they're gonna buy in, in, in terms of some sort of emotion. But they have to be a lot more logical. We look at angel investors who are taking more of a punt on you guys and taking more of a punt on the team, potentially have some sort of biases, which we're gonna look at later on as well. Um, some sort of biases that are, like, are drawing them to your industry, are drawing them to your product or value proposition, right? They're gonna be influenced a little bit more by emotion, but of course, you still have to logically justify why they should be investing in you guys, right? So when you can correctly balance logic and emotion, what you have is a commitment from the investor. So that's it, guys. This last bit is about the pitch anatomy. I, we've already talked about it. You can find like a dozen of these. This is literally just an anatomy that's colorful. It's really no different to anything else you can find on the internet. But you're gonna to have to hit these certain points. You're gonna to have to tell them about the problem. You're gonna to have to tell them about a solution, a competitor analysis. Like there's no real point going through each of these because we don't have a lot of time. If you guys have questions on it, of course, come ask me at the break. Um, but there's a, a really good, yes, like a litmus, not, not so much a litmus test, but like a rule of thumb by a guy, um, Kowalski. Kawasaki, Kawasaki, Guy Kawasaki, right? Um, is a 10, 20, 30 rule. 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point font, right? Really good fundamentals behind that, right? 30 point font, don't use too, too, too much text, all right? Text dense is just gonna kill the limbic system because it's boring as hell, right? 20 minutes, generally speaking, it's gonna be hard to sustain attention past that every seven seconds, right? And 10, and 10 slides, like that's not a steadfast rule but 10 slides works to tick off most of these. So that's pretty much it, guys. I'll take two questions, and then we'll take a quick break, and then we'll have Brennan, who has left the room, <laughs> up for law advising. Any questions? Yes. Uh, just some examples when you said infusing emotion into them. Mm -hmm. Just give us an example of what that might help. Yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna talk a little bit later in terms of how you actually um, encourage an emotional response from anybody. 
And emotions triggered by empathy, right? So if you can get them to empathize with the problem. So like Matt talked about, you do your research on them, you know what type of um, businesses they've invested in before, potentially you might know like their personal history. I don't know how you would find that, but like there's that stuff out there if it's very public knowledge. Then you can actually start to tailor it. Again, what Matt talked about, phenomenal like insight from Matt was this idea of recalibrating your pitch to an extent to adjust for the criteria of investment for that particular investor, right? So how you engage emotion is you have to make it empathetic for them. If they can position themselves in the shoes of that problem, for instance, if you know of a personal relationship they have or um, a, a business relationship they have where they've experienced something similar, you can calibrate your pitch to account for those things. So that's how you're going to induce emotion. But again, we'll go into that in a bit more detail in the neuroscience session. Any other questions? Um, if you, you might want to talk about um, the website where pitch eggs are. Yeah, you can have a look at Pitch Envy. You can have a look at, you can just, okay, so pitch, pitch yeah, Pitch Envy, I think it's pitchenvy.com. That just has a lot of really awesome pitch decks on it. Um, a couple of my favorites are Airbnb's first one. Um, Facebook's first one's up there, but like I'm not a huge fan of it. It's just really text dense, and I'm just, just personally, I don't like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, LinkedIn Series B is up there. Again, like it's, it's a little text dense, but what you have to understand is like as you go further through um, your, your fundraising rounds, you, you're gonna have to change your pitch deck, right? Like you go to a Series A or Series B and you, thro you throw just these things, they're like, okay, great, I knew that, right? That's why we're meeting with you, right? So the further in you get in, in terms of your rounds, like Series A, Series B, LinkedIn with Series B, you have to show them more detail about like your like revenues, um, your revenue numbers, different metrics, like the priorities start to change as you get further down. So yeah, LinkedIn series B's up, it's a lot more detailed than we'll look at in, for instance, like a seed round. Awesome stuff, guys. Um, we're gonna take two minutes, because we just had a quick break, two minutes, and then we're gonna get Brennan from Law Advisor up. He's gonna chat us through uh, his raising experiences. Cool.